cineasta soviética que eh, trágicamente bueno, vio interrumpida su carrera. la película El Ascenso. Eh, en el marco de la retrospectiva que FICUNAM le está dedicando, hemos invitado a Olaf Moller a conversar esta día sobre eh, justamente la filmografía de esta cineasta. Eh, ella nació en Ucrania, en la región de Ucrania, en una Unión Soviética todavía, y nos parecía muy interesante traer al público mexicano justo esta mirada eh, de una cineasta poco conocida en nuestro país y que, bueno, dejó una filmografía muy rica con una sensibilidad muy peculiar, eh, un punto de vista de un momento también histórico que le tocó vivir y que, pues, no, no ha sido muy difundido en nuestro país. Y bueno, Olaf Moller es un amante, un amante del cine, Creo que sobre todo, eh, lo que nos dijo cuando le pedimos su semblanza es, yo me dedico a ver películas y a compartir eventualmente lo que pienso de ellas. Eh, y bueno, es un amigo del festival, es, ya ha estado en otras ocasiones con nosotros, se dedica justamente, yo creo, a estudiar el cine y a compartir lo que ve y lo que lo que encuentra en las películas. Y yo espero que hoy comparta con nosotros justamente lo que piensa y lo que ha visto de la Muchas gracias, doctor por estar con nosotros. Careful what you clap, clap for, you haven't heard anything yet. Ah, folks, don't you have anything better to do than listen to a fat German talk about Soviet cinema, really. Don't you have a life? It's spring, it's lunchtime, you could eat something, you could watch a movie. Okay, I will try to make it worth the while. I try. And I have no idea how long I will talk. So, um, essentially all of this happened to me, but I have one question. Could you please stop taping me or taking photographs or whatever? I really hate how I look. I really hate pictures of myself. And I really fucking go ballistic when I find myself on the internet. So please, whatever you did so far, erase it. It's cancel culture time. Cancel my image on your mobile phones. Thank you. Um, so. Um, I was actually asked by Michelle Lipkes to do this because we were writing before the festival and suddenly he was asking me something about the film The Beginning of an Unknown Century and he said, how, can we, how could this film have been made? Everything about it seems to make it impossible. And I said, uh, so what's the problem? Yeah, well, this guy was censored and this guy is censored and how could they make a film about writers that are all censored? And I could only say because they weren't censored. This is a very complicated question. And it's also a question asked about a very particular moment in time. So we will have to talk a lot about Soviet history to properly understand Larissa Shepitko. Let me also be very clear that I will try to make sense of Larissa Shepitko as a Soviet filmmaker. And I will try to make sense of her in the way that she would hopefully have liked somebody to make sense out of her life and her person. Which is not normal to a certain degree. Let me tell you a little story. A few years ago in Switzerland, the cinema did a Larissa Shepitko retrospective and a friend of mine who was one of really the finest minds on Soviet cinema in the German-speaking world, was asked to write a little, well, a little essay for the catalog. And she did that. And the people at the cinema were like, but we can't publish this. This is not our viewpoint. She's a feminist filmmaker, and you are saying she's not a feminist. And my friend said, 
of course she's not a feminist. She would be, she would be disgusted if you would talk all her that. This is not the way she functions and considered herself in the Soviet context. This is a completely alien concept to her. Well, what did they do? They did get another writer so that they did have now their little bourgeois icon. Which is also to say that film history is obviously something that is used and abused. We create in history often the images that we need. Often in defiance of the reality, the historical reality of these people and the works they created. Of course, it's, this is what happens when you are dead. You can't defend yourself anymore. This is what happens with history and time. Things get muddled, they get reinterpreted, they get used, they get appropriated. But as I tend to tell my students in Helsinki, folks, before you start appropriating, you better understand the material that you are appropriating. You better understand what you are working with before you start to work with it. I hope, Courtney, this is also a good summary of what you are saying in what you said in before. Oh, thank you. So I understood you correctly. Good. I learned my lesson today. So, um, how to begin with Larissa Shepitko? One of the things that one constantly reads about her is that she is a forgotten filmmaker. Let me very stridently say that I deeply disdain this expression, a forgotten filmmaker. It's so whiny. It's so forgiving. Filmmakers are not forgotten. Filmmakers are discarded. Filmmakers are pushed aside. Filmmakers are discontinued. And not only filmmakers, but whole film cultures. Larissa Shepitku was discontinued in film history in the early 90s, together with more or less the whole of Soviet film history. We have to understand and appreciate that at least in some parts of the world, till the early 90s, Soviet film culture was something that people did know. It was in the cinemas. It was something, I wouldn't say, depending on where you were, normal. But Soviet film culture, in quite intricate detail, was present. This ends after 89. Soviet film culture stops being present. Film archives stop doing, let's say, retrospectives on Soviet directors who are not Tarkovsky, not Dovshenko, not Vertov, and not Eisenstein. Essentially, since 89, this is what you usually get. This is what Soviet cinema is reduced to. Mainly the great formalists, the great avant-garde of the 20s. Very little afterwards. So we can always stay with this kind of dream of this culture that was once so splendid and came up with all these crazy formal, uh, formal solutions. And we don't need to deal with any of the more complex stuff that happened afterwards. So indeed, Larissa Shepitko was not forgotten. She was, with the whole film culture, thrown away. We should also say that forgotten suggests an idea that we all know the same film culture. This is blatant nonsense. We do not all know the same film culture. We are at very different places in the world. And in these different places, film culture is cultivated in different fashions. A lot of this is depending often on accidents. Let me again tell you a little story. When years ago, the Rotterdam Film Festival presented a retrospective of the Japanese director, Uchida Tomo. Um, everybody was going crazy about a film called Kiga Kaikyo, uh, The Straits of Hunger. And I was like, yeah, so? And they were like, uh, what, yeah, so? I could say, dude, in Cologne, this film is canonical. 
because we have a print in Cologne and that's screened quite often. If you are a cinephile in Cologne, then this film is very much part of your world. Silence. Everybody's staring at me, and why do you have a print in Cologne? Very simple, because we have a Japan Foundation in Cologne that has a film library. So, all of these accidents, these particularities, shape where we are in terms of film culture, and it also shapes what we remember, what we forget, what we discard. Larissa Shepitko was certainly more remembered in Germany then she was remembered in quite a few other places for the very simple reason that Larissa Shepitko won the Golden Bear. And that after her tragic demise, the festival very much remembered her. When her widower, Ellen Klimov, finished her last film, the film that she died, uh, during those preparations she died, uh, Farewell, I mean, Come on, you die over a film that's called Farewell. That's <clears throat> um, this was a big deal at the Berlinale. When the Berlinale later did retrospectives of itself, this film was usually very present. And indeed, the film was distributed in Germany. And I say really in Germany because I mean West and East. So we knew this film all the time. And for people my age, Larissa Schipitko was never forgotten. We were missing the screenings, but the film, certainly this one, was quite present. So beware when you talk about uh, general ideas of film history, general ideas of, let's say, something like forgotten. This is very, very specific stuff. Film history in general is highly specific. I know that we are doing a lot to kind of make it more universal, but I should say, I do really deride the criterion collection universalism of film culture. I do delight in the fact that film culture is so incredibly specific and built on so many accidents at times. So yes, Larissa Shepitko, not forgotten but discarded. And film history, certainly something much more complex than we in its way how stuff gets shown, where it gets shown, etc. And of course, also how it gets narrated. Very much part and parcel to the myth of Larissa Shepitko, because there is a myth of Larissa Shepitko, is the history of her being censored so much, which in some ways is true, and in other ways we can, can only say, yeah, dude, look at the period when she's working. Uh, being censored is one of the probably most normal things most Soviet directors experienced. This is no big deal in many ways. It was a big deal for the production units because they may not see their bonus at the end of the year. But for the filmmakers themselves, this was something that was always there. And it's something that was unpredictable in many cases. I will talk a little bit about that in apropos film this film called um, The Beginning of an Unknown Century, because this is really a very nice example where you can see the, really the particularity and the, and the vagaries of Soviet censorship and what this actually means, because this is also quite complicated. So there is this whole kind of almost marcher-like image that is connected with her, so often, um, so often censored so few films. By Soviet standards, she had actually quite a, an active career. We have to always remember that she did not live long. For her lifespan, she has a pretty okay track record. It's, she's not one of those directors of which the Soviet Union had very few who did make a film every year or every two years. She made a film roughly every three years, and it was kind of normal. If you weren't really one of the, let's say, industry car craftsmen, this was a very normal speed. So there's nothing special about her making so few films. Actually, in terms of that, her husband, widower, Ellen Klimov, is a more tragic case because he didn't make that many more films than she did, but he worked, theoretically speaking, over a much, much longer period of time. 
Anyway, this thing with the marcher isn't so far interesting as her last film is a film about martyrdom. So we might say that the, it's an easy combination. The martyred director with the big masterpiece that is essentially a film about Christian martyrdom and ascendance in the end, because the last film would be ascendance. A film even with a very Christian title, but we will also come to that. So, what were, who was Larissa Shepitko in her lifetime? She was actually something that is people today either don't know anymore or don't find interesting to consider. She was probably the only female director who was actually quite well known to a general public. So yes, the Soviet Union did have at that point in time quite a few female directors. In fact, probably the Soviet Union, together with Denmark, are the only film cultures that have a track record of film having fil female filmmakers, and quite a few always, all through their history. And I should also say this continues till this day. There are quite a few female filmmakers in Russia that we do not get to see too much of them is something that should give us a little pause. Something to think about, because indeed there are quite a few. So, Shepitko is not the only female filmmaker at that point in time. One should also say, let's remember that, for example, the biggest cult item in Soviet television was directed by a woman. It's a TV espionage crime series called 17 Moments of Spring. So basically the thing that every Soviet citizen probably watched was directed by a woman. Actually, there are people who are saying that Vladimir Putin became actually president because he resembles the main character of that film so much. It's a very weird story. Anyway, Shepitko was something else. She was beautiful. She was an astoundingly looking woman who also by Soviet standards had a certain, let's say, almost exotic je ne sais quoi, which has to do with the fact that her mother is was her mother, a school teacher, was Ukrainian, but her father, a soldier, was from Iran. And you can see that slightly in her face. In her, facial, in, in her features, that she did have an Iranian parent, so to speak, of whom she didn't see too much. It has been often pointed out that a lot of the melancholy in her films can be traced back to the fact that she essentially grew up without a father, that there was always this, this the story of the distant father who left the family and all that. She was from the very first film on Successful. And so was her husband, whom she met while editing her first film, Heat, Snipe. They were really the intellectual glam couple of the Soviet 60s and 70s, which saw to it that you did read about Larissa Shepitko in magazines that would usually not write about directors like her. Because these were magazines that were more devoted to, let's say, a more popular kind of cinema. But yes, you would find images of uh, Shepitko there, and actually also reviews of her films, often very supportive reviews. Which is also to say that for all her sometimes avant-garde panache, Shepitko also did have a very popular side. And it is quite telling that despite all that talk about censorship, one of her censored films plays, very, plays only a tiny role in general discussions these days of her films, which is You and Me, 
her second, her only feature done for cinema in color, and certainly her most popular film in terms of its aesthetics. So yes, we are, to a certain degree, often reducing Shepitko to a more artistic director than she herself maybe wanted to be. Shepitko is difficult to pinpoint because all her films are different. All her films have a different aesthetic approach. You can see, in some cases, certain similarities, especially in, uh, let's say, her kind of more warlike uh, narratives, meaning her episode of the beginning of an unknown century, well, not war, but war connected, and the ascent, where she goes very strongly for abstraction. But then again, something like you and me, or also the greatest parts of, um, of Wings, a film that has a rather astonishing career by now, for many years almost disregarded by now, essentially venerated as her great masterpiece. These are films that certainly, as I said, they do have something going on there. So Shepitko was, and that is something I find really interesting, she's always trying something new. And more importantly, she always tries to be a contemporary. And I think one of the things that film culture these days has a monumental problem with is the idea of contemporaneity in a filmmaker. Somebody who is always at the moment and reacting to that moment, which to a certain degree often makes their films more difficult to read because you have to understand the moment to get into the films in a proper fashion. As I already suggested, Shepitko would really not like to have been identified as a female filmmaker. This was actually tried. It's not surprising that that was tried. She was, in several interviews, she was asked whether there was something, whether she identified as a female filmmaker, whether she saw some special femininity in her filmmaking, and she always rigorously denied that. Actually, at one point, and that's where actually the title for this talk came from, she said, 90% of all filmmaking is, let's say, it's difficult to translate. What she says is, um, let's say, female fuzziness. And only 10% are real cinema. So she indeed uses a certain idea, let's say, of femininity in a negative way. I mean, I always understood it as her saying that these films are what she finds disregard disregardable, that this was like, let's say, needle pin work that bourgeois women would do out of boredom. And that the real stuff is something very different. But she said there is either real cinema or no cinema, so to speak. It has nothing to do with whether you are a man or a woman. Either you make a real film or you don't. The attempt to, let's say, corner female filmmakers like that is actually something quite intriguing to observe in the history of cinema. There is, for example, another director from the People's Republic of China, Wang Peng. She was the first female director of the People's Republic of China. And it is quite interesting, if you track writings about her, that right reviewers were always trying to find something specifically feminine about her films. Although she herself was always very clear that this did not play any role for her. And if you look at the films, they are very much classical, socialist, realist model movies. But still, as she was a woman, there was a deep need to project an idea of femininity onto her. Similar things happened with, uh, with Shepitko. 
while we should say, we could basically say that is, you, might, you might call this the bourgeoisization of a certain kind of attitude in film culture because she was in many ways living the Soviet dream. An independent woman working, being as far as possible the master of her own destiny, not chained by any kinds of laws, etc., to a man or whatever, free to express herself and make herself useful for her culture. She was really a Soviet director. And my God, do we have a problem these days to actually, actually even accept that, because that means also accepting that there were good things about state socialist culture. But yes, a lot of the things that are great about Larissa Shepitko are connected with the fact that she is a director from a state socialist country who took advantage of all the opportunities and privileges to a certain degree, accorded to the ones who tried, who dared, and who actually delivered. So she is, if we really want to appreciate her, we have to accept that with that, we have to appreciate also a lot of things that obviously were quite helpful in socialist cultures. She is not a bourgeois liberated woman, she is a socialist liberated woman. I also would I like to add here also one more detail that is also connected to this. Um, I was a few years ago part of a, of a big seminar on, let's say, the awkward feminism of Central and Eastern European culture and cinema. I was actually the only man. Um, and one of the things that a lot of the um, women from those parts of the world said quite in unison was that quite a few of them never really felt the need to have a female director because men did a good job in presenting their point of view. So they felt as subjects of their socialist society, taken very seriously and well represented by male directors. Which means having that, on the other hand, as a, as a female director, you were to a certain degree also delivered of the burden of having to present that perspective. So this is a very different way of looking at this from a historic perspective, so to speak. This is a very different world. Shepitko came from a world that is very, very different from anything we know these days. And we should really tread carefully in the way that we deal with her films, because we might step on the booby traps of our own capitalist bourgeois education and culture, and they might explode into our face. So let's take a look at uh, Shepitko in a rather chronological order. She is actually, oh, how perfect for this timing. She's actually Ukrainian. She was born in the Ukrainian SSR. And her big teacher was the greatest of all Ukrainian masters, Alexander Dovshenko. And the first feature film on which she worked as um, assistant director is actually something that you get to see her, the poem of the sea, which was actually finalized based on plans by Dovshenko, by his wife, Yulia Sanseva. There we also have a very, very interesting dynamic. How Sanseva was in some ways always in the shadows of Dovshenko, and on the other hand, also, let's say, surfing the Dovshenko wave, because she made a lot of films 
that were connected with her late husband. But she also made a few films that were not. Anyway, so with this project, The Poem of the Sea, she is with the last project, so to speak, of Dovshenko. She is with Dovshenko's wife, Yulia uh, Sansova. And she is in it actually also as an actress. She's a young woman at that point in time. She has this very, very small part. And this is where she, to a certain degree, learned hands-on directing. She was at the gig, that's the all-union uh, state uh, school for, for, for cinema. And indeed, in her class, let's stress, at that place, at that moment, the only woman in her class. I'm saying let's stress that because people, again, tend to forget that this was not the only educational institution in the Soviet Union. We did, for example, also have the famous higher courses for directors, which, again, were organized in a different fashion. And indeed, you would probably also find women there. But at that time, at the geek, in her batch, she's the only woman. She is actually 16 when she enrolls at the geek. So she's quite young still. She is somewhere in her early 20s when she does her final thesis film. And that's a film called Snai Heat. Now, that film is actually quite typical for the cinema of that period. Why? Shepitko went to Central Asia to make a film. And that was something quite a few young directors at that point in time did. Let's just mention that um, somebody who I think must have been either in her, in her class or one class above her or roughly the same period, um, Andrei Konchalovsky. He went also to Central Asia and did his film The First Teacher. Or let's mention Vladimir Motil, the director of one of the biggest all-time successes of uh, Soviet cinema, The White Sun of the Desert. He went to Central Asia to make uh, Children of the Pamir. So, yes, quite a few directors went to Central Asia. Why? Interesting question. The 60s are a moment when the, the republics of the Soviet Union are, let's say, finding their own voices, are allowed to find their own voices, are encouraged to find their own voices. Late 50s, early 60s saw masses of debuts by directors from the Central Asian states, but also the Baltics, for example. And they would join with the directors from the more sent from the heartland, so to speak, meaning the Russian-speaking world, in creating what you could call the young cinema, the, the new wave, uh, uh, new wave of um, Soviet cinema. And this was done in a rather intriguing spirit because quite a few of these directors almost stayed there. It's very interesting if you look at the filmography of uh, Konchalovsky and Konchalovsky's super pal Andrei Tarkovsky. How many screenplays they wrote for films in Central Asia. Several of the biggest Central Asian films of the 60s were written by these guys. Films like Tashkent, City of Bread, or End of uh, the Ataman. Sometimes really written for young directors, sometimes really for old masters like Shakin Aitmatov. So, but Shepitko is there as one of the first, interestingly enough. And she is telling a story that reflects, interestingly, on an earlier moment when Soviet youths went in that direction. 
which is the virgin soil campaign, which happens in the mid 50s. Again, Soviet youth going to the outer reaches of the empire, trying to help cultivate these parts of the empire. So yes, Shepitko is essentially behaving almost in accordance with what was going on at the moment. She's a little bit of a pathbreaker. She's on the other hand also something, somebody who is reflecting on the historical moments behind it. And she is trying out her first aesthetic approach, which is more a classical realist approach. <sighs> Folks, never become somebody who people think that has some, he has something to say. It's very, very difficult doing this. Sometimes I need to drink, sorry. Um, otherwise, I sound like a raven and an unhappy raven at that. So, so her first film does indeed reflect the realist interests of a certain generation in Soviet cinema at that point in time. So if we look at the development of, let's say, aesthetic sensibilities in the Soviet Union, in the post-Stalin period. Just a reminder, Stalin dies 1953. We have a period then that's what's called Thaw. Thaw period is 1953 till roughly 1956. 1957 is slowly the beginning of the glorious 60s. So, we might say that Shepitko, in her aesthetics, reflects already, we are really only a few years apart, on the Thaw period and on the early aesthetic interests of the Thaw period, carrying them on to the glorious 60s. The film was really a massive success and really established her name and made it possible for her to make the film Wings. Now, Wings was a whole different ballgame. Again, a film with a realist approach, albeit a realist approach that is already a bit leaner, a bit more, I wouldn't say stylized, but edgier. A realist approach that does have a certain oomph to it. And it is an interesting story. It's a story of a, of a female fighter pilot who is now living in peace times, but for whom the war in a certain way never ended. In one of the greatest moments of the film, she goes into a museum and she looks at herself. There she is, a glorious figure of the past, but she's still alive. This was really a big deal at that point in time in Soviet cinema, because we have to remember one thing. War cinema, war movies are very, very key to the Soviet Union, especially the period from 1945 on. This is the great national narrative. However big or small the film you did, but there you were engaging with the big national narrative, with the big myth. And she was ever so slightly asking a very interesting question. What happens if the myth indeed becomes a myth? And you live with it. It's a question I'm sure that millions of veterans of the war we're living with. Millions of women and men who every year went to the uh, Victory Day parade wearing their medals, looking proud, having been part of the great liberation of the world from fascism, having been part of the great liberator army, but also understanding that they are a cult of the past. <laughs> 
that what they are celebrating here is something that they aren't anymore. The whole nation constantly feeling the discrepancy between the national myth and the reality, because the national myth is still, so to speak, living, or the carriers of that myth. In that regard, she really broke quite new ground. And that also made the film really a problem at that point in time in 1966, if I remember it correctly. Yes. Oh, my God, my old brain is not completely fucked up anymore. Completely. So, um, why is that a touchy moment? Okay, now we come really into the microstructures of Soviet history. 1964, Khrushchev is basically dismissed. Too liberal. He is replaced, after some time, by a more conservative guy, Leonid Brezhnev. So, and now we start into a rather, film historically rather intriguing period. Because on the one hand, you have all these young directors who are a product of the Khrushchev era, the great three thinkers, the people who actually were raised on the promise of artistic and otherwise freedom of expression that a lot of their forefathers didn't see, and where they knew that they were on the same level as the rest of the world. This is the most international moment probably in Soviet cinema. They are in sync with everybody, so to speak. And then the hammer falls. And Brezhnev goes for a very tough cultural politic. And this is where this film clashes. The film becomes a problem for the reconservation or the, the, the making Soviet culture again more conservative, more orthodox. Two years earlier, this film would have passed without problems. A few people probably would have meh, 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 but still, it wouldn't have been that big a deal. 1966, because Brezhnev tries to really gain a firm footing. And this is more or less also the moment when the fiercest period of censorship of the Brezhnev period starts. I mean, we have three, three and a half years where so many films get, I mean, only shelved. I'm only talking about the shelved movies. I'm not talking about the films that were re-edited. I'm not talking about the films that were given the uh, category three um, distribution um, seal, which meant essentially distribution with only a handful of prints in a few cities for a few days. No, no, I mean the films that really went on a shelf. Brezhnev really, with an iron fist, tried to gain control of culture. And cinema was certainly made to feel it. And so into these debates comes this film, which at that point in time, if I remember it still correctly, as I said, I'm an old guy, but hmm, if I remember correctly, it did despite all the trouble, actually get released in a very small way, but after this small release kind of vanished. And it's quite interesting that for a long time it did not play that big a role in discussions of Shepitko. The film was really a little bit out of sight. The problems continue with the beginning of an unknown century. So, Michelle asked me how could they make films, an episode movie based on writers that are all forbidden. Well, Soviet Union is a very complicated place. Shepitko chose Andrei Platonov for the source of 
her short film. Well, it's not exactly as if Platonov was forbidden. Some of Platonov's books actually were never really published, but other stuff was there. To give an idea of how at times schizophrenic this is, actually an example from Platonov serves very well because Platonov wrote a series very early in the, um, during the Soviet period, so really the first years of the, of the Soviet Union, he wrote slightly in the provinces lots of articles about, let's say, Soviet ethics, about what does it mean to be a good Soviet this, that, etc. These articles were published without any big problems. But when Platonov wanted to collect them in one volume, he was told that he couldn't do that. So you could run them in a newspaper, but you could not collect them in a book. So this is the kind of stuff where, that you are discussing when you talk about Soviet censorship. Quite a few stuff was available. If it was not actively sold, you might find it in the library. Other stuff did not even get published. Platonov was one of these strange cases. So it's, in that regard, also not surprising that for a film that was made for the 50th anniversary of the Soviet Revolution, that she would choose a story by Platonov. Actually, a very, a very sensible choice. Now, what happened here? If you want to really get an idea of how goddamn crazy in a certain way the Soviet Union is, do yourself a favor and watch all the films that were made for the 50th anniversary of the Soviet Union. I dare you to find another corpus of films that is on average, so avant-garde. Some of the most avant-garde films in the history of the Soviet Union were made for that occasion. Because that's also the zeitgeist. So, making an omnibus film with an, at times, quite avant-garde aesthetic based on problematic writers did, was actually not as odd a project beginning in 1966, so to speak, conception, as it might look. But in 67, we are already in a much tougher censorship period. So something that might look in 66 as if it could maybe just slip through is already then a problem. And indeed, the film was then shelved, although even that is not correct to say, because what we know today is a film made of two parts. But as I said, it was actually a film made of three parts. So what happened to the third part? Well, that was screened on television a few years later basically as a short television movie. This film was seen with not, without any kinds of problems. It is interesting, though, that whenever people today scream the beginning of an unknown century, they never add this episode. It's available. It's in the archive. No problem. Who did show all three parts together? Yes. I'm a genius, I'm sorry. Um, uh, finally, somebody's laughing. Um, no, but um, I was really always astonished that nobody else did this. I did this in a program on Soviet um, 50, 60 cinema in, ben in Vienna, and uh, yeah, there, there is the third film. The film sucks, it's really boring. I mean, nobody is showing it maybe because it's so boring. It's, it's really just a bad comedy. But it really gives an interesting perspective. 
because we see, okay, originally it would have been this ultra-violent, stylized war narrative, the angel, then this super artistically uber-stylized, it's essentially Giacometti in motion about the early fights of the revolution in terms of electrification, etc. Yeah, and when is this a silly comedy? Um, by a director you have never heard of. And actually I even forgot his name because his career is so goddamn undistinctive. God knows why these three people were put together. But this is what this film was supposed to be and whoever screens this project can screen the third film because it does give an added perspective for what this project as such was because the two films that you see together now are much edgier in their combination than what you would have had if you screened all three together. It's also after that project which which um, is quite intriguing is that she also understood obviously she needed to, to stay in the game. So she was also quite smart in managing her career. So what did she do? So she had one film that had slight trouble, one film that had big trouble. So what did she do? She didn't make television film. And that's probably her most mysterious movie, The Thirteenth Hour of the Night, which is actually um, um, a New Year's Eve special that she, <clears throat> a little secret, as far as I know, unofficially co-directed with her husband, um, but we only have her as a director, but it seems from some information that Klimov was also involved in making that film. And some of the humor in the film would at least suggest that Klimov was somewhere around. Because if one knows the early Klimov comedies, one can see shadows of that in the, in the humor of that film. And that's really a crazy film. That also shows that um, she had really a wild imagination. I mean, it's essentially like, on the one hand, it's Jacques Demy on acid. And on the other hand, in, with really typically Soviet characters, and on the other hand, it's these variety acts. The variety acts are so boring. It's like very boring juggling and stuff like that. But the, the, the funky characters, so it's actually kind of the, the Soviet Adams family, so to speak. Um, the Soviet Adams family is watching boring um, variety acts on television. That's kind of the narrative for one hour. And that was, yes, shown on television. It's interesting that this is a film also, again, very rarely looked into in the discussions of Shepitko, because it was probably a television film. But I think, for one thing, it was something that offered her the chance to experiment with something, with, with certain aesthetics. On the other hand, it was a way of showing that she was a good team player. For me, one of the also quite interesting details is that one of the actors in that film is Vladimir Basov. And Basov was, as a director, one of the, let's say, he belonged to the conservative new cinema vanguard. So Basov made very important films in the 60s. And indeed, he's the director of the film that made Vladimir Putin join the Secret Service. At least that's what Putin has been telling everybody for ages. He saw Shield and Sword, which is like the KGB epic, directed by Basov, four parts, eternally long, great entertainment, and he wanted also to be a KGB operative. Thank you, Vladimir Basov. So, um, so this figure is in that film, which also gives you an idea of how people were 
despite obvious aesthetic and otherwise differences, still working together. So it's, this film is really an offbeat jam. And one of those films where you, that you, whenever you watch something or think of something that is really Shepitko, the great avant-gardist, tough stuff, always think of that film. There's also this side to her. And her next film will consolidate that. And that is the mysterious you and I. The Soviet Union has moved on by the time Shepitko made you and I. It's 1971, if my feeble brain hopefully remembers correctly. Yay, feeble brain still works. So, um, it's 1971, and Soviet culture as well as what's it, Soviet Union has found a very particular groove. It becomes more intimist. It becomes very inward looking. And it is something that you can actually see in several state socialist cultures. It's really interesting that at the same time, aesthetically the same happens in um, the German Democratic Republic, Vulgo, East Germany. You see traces of that in a normalization uh, uh, Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. So this inwardness is a certain trend of the 70s in state socialist countries, probably because the countries in a strange way, A, had arrived at themselves, and B, had gone through some quite cataclysmic changes and challenges. Please remember that in 1968, led by the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact invades Czechoslovak Socialist Republic and destroys the Prague Spring. So the things that happen afterwards are very much defined by this. One starts to look more into personal relationships. And this is when into personal destinies. The state moves to a background, so to speak. The cinema becomes more, let's say, chamber play, just as a mindset. The big official cinema starts to ossify in many ways. So the world outside becomes something, let's say the grand narrative becomes something that is, becomes ever more abstract. If you look at the big war movies of the 70s, like the big ones, like Liberation, they really feel like yeah, almost like monumental, monumental puppet shows, devoid of the extraordinary energy and inventiveness that you had 10 years earlier. All the inventiveness and energy goes into inwardness. With you and me, we do actually have um, intellectuals in an intellectualist crisis, but we also have at the beginning of this film a scene that so far none of my Russian film historian friends could explain to me. Because the film starts, somebody coming to a door, knock, knock, door opens, and what do we see? A guy dressed as a cowboy, slinging a gun, saying, hands up, with a very heavy Russian accent. And then another guy grabs um, how do you call it, Bohrer, um, a, drill, a, a, a power drill, and the Bond theme begins. And they play a shootout set to the Bond theme. Now, why is this interesting? Because the first Bond film was released in the Soviet Union only in the 80s. So, and here we come to a point that, for me, is way too little observed with, in discussions of Soviet film culture. People are so obsessed with hidden meanings, with allegorical dimensions, that they are not looking at what is there right in front of their faces. 
Why is in a film of 1971 the Bond theme at the beginning of the film? Who would have been able to identify that? And this is something, as I said, I've discussed with several of my Russian um, historian friends. This is something none of us can really say. We can only assume that why so ever the Bond theme was known, even if people had never seen a Bond movie, but they knew the, mu the music. And indeed, I did find, I think, in one earlier Soviet film, a moment when on the soundtrack you heard a variation of the Bond theme. So yes, this was something that people could identify as something, so to speak. And this film, this opening, sets very much the stage of, for what the film is, because on the one hand, it does suggest its own more entertaining nature. On the other hand, it suggests an internationalism that is in stark contrast with the intimism, with the ultra-deep, hardcore USSR. Actually, it's really more like Russian, heartland, intellectual, brooding. So it's, it's a film that is very conscious about the world and itself, its place in the world. And it's also very conscious about what it suggests its Soviet audiences at that point in time, when it's basically talking about the inwardness, that there is a world out there, and that this world, to a certain degree, might be creating Soviet, the problems for the Soviet state with a culture that is maybe not too Soviet, but looks attractive. The film is, on one of its many levels, um, a film about consumerism, something one would not necessarily associate with a Soviet subject. But indeed, you do have, on one level of this film, the idea of a threat, the complexities of being a consumer, and what that means in a culture, or for a culture, that is stridently non-consumerist. In some ways, this is probably the most complicated film of Shepitko because it takes the widest stride. It is the film that tries to measure the distance between the world and the Soviet Union. It's interesting that the film, as I said, also again, was, is, is not one of the films that really is too often discussed, although in a, despite its kind of fluffy ways almost, and it's kind of a little lanky, so to speak, aesthetic, not as rigorous as some of the other works of her. It is probably the, the film that is the deepest and the most complex in what it has to say on an intellectual level. Which leaves us only with one film, and the film for which she's probably best known. I won't say justly, but I would be an idiot to say, to if I, if I would suggest that this film is nothing less than a masterpiece, Ascent, or The Ascent. Now again, this film is also working inside a very specific framework. The framework of Belorussian great patriotic war narratives. The Belorussian stuff is almost a subcategory on its own in this huge complex of great patriotic war literature. Because Belorussia really had one of the worst, we really got it almost the worst. And Belorussia really saw suffering that is quite unspeakable. And it is interesting to see that in the 60s, it was indeed a Belorussian director, Turov, who with um, films like I Come from the, from, the, from the Childhood, by the way, probably my favorite movie title of all times, um, and uh, The Way Through the Graveyard, redefined really a whole way of narrating the war, a very specific way. The film is based on the work of uh, Vasil Bukow, 
who is one of the greatest Belarusian writers of World War II, Great Patriotic War narratives. So she steps into really a massive territory with that one. Bikau is actually adapted quite a bit at that point in time. So she is actually filming somebody who is, I wouldn't say a la vogue, but yes, since the 60s, quite continuously adaptations of Bikau were made. So in a certain way, this also looks like a very, mm, let's say, non-dangerous story. Now, as we can see from the subtle shift between the title of the work by Bukow, Sotnikov, which is the name of one of the characters, and the film title of the Shepitko, Ascent, which is really the Christian Ascension, Ascension Day. It's a very Christian term. She stresses something that is in some ways inherent into the Soviet war narrative. Now, it's, if you read up on the, on the one hand, the, the, the bit the censorship history of that film, there's this crazy story that the film was really a big, big problem for everybody, and um, it was saved by the, who was it? The, the head of the Belorussian Central Committee or something like that who identified as a war veteran with the film so much that um, he went against, above all objections, and said, this film has to be seen. And then, well, there are the stories how that film came to the Berlinale. And it's interesting to see that the religious part is always stressed. I mean, there are some stories about that are really hilarious. People from the Berlinale going together to the toilet, flushing the whole time because the KGB is always there, and whispering below the flushes, we, we have to, we have to basically take this, the film, it's so subversive, lots of religion, and we have to also take another Soviet film just to cover our tracks. So, the thing is only, I have a hard time really believing that, because, if we look at Soviet war cinema, we will find out that if there is any place in Soviet culture where Christian religion is constantly visible, it's the war narrative. People making the sign of the cross, people evoking God, all of that kind of Christian stuff, you can find that in the war narrative. This is, that religion is evoked in a war movie is not unusual. We might say that the war scene as a kind of passion play, because this is what the film fundamentally is, is unusual. Maybe she really went for some people too far and made more a religious film in the guise of a war movie than a war movie that works with religious imagery. This is for other people to discuss. But what we can say is for certain that just religiosity, that would be really strange because otherwise this is not really a big problem in Soviet war narratives, in just about every other narrative, but not war. And please remember, I mean, one of the big songs of uh, the Great Patriotic War is actually called The Holy War. There was always a religious dimension to that. You might say that there are very few films that go so deep into the religious dimension of the Great Patriotic War as this film. I would have actually a hard time to think of another Soviet era film that really grabs it so deeply as a Christian martyrdom experience, so to speak. But still, we are in a territory that is not completely, completely off. The film really makes her internationally. I mean, she is already there, as I said. She did have her films earlier shown at big Western festivals. 
She did win awards, etc. But she wins Berlin, and that is a big deal. Why? Because the Berlinale up until, I think, 1973 did not show Soviet films. In fact, there was a very the whole thing that was going on between the Berlinale and Central and Eastern Europe was a very complicated question of constant negotiations. But there comes a point when they do find an agreement and Soviet movies start to be shown at the Berlinale. And then it's this film that kind of seals the deal between the Berlinale and the Soviet Union. That gives the film a kind of importance for the festival, but also, in many ways, the positioning, the political repositioning of Soviet cinema in the 70s. So in that regard, this Golden Bear is a monumental political gesture. But it's also a monumental artistic gesture. Thank God. So yes, the great masterpiece for once deservedly got the best film award. Shepitko was really at a point in time now that she could really, probably would have done whatever she wanted. And indeed, she started production on this film, Farewell, and died. It is interesting that with Farewell, she would have returned to the world of the first film on which she was an assistant director, The Poem of the Sea. And that in a certain way, she would have revisited the motifs of this world, building, destroying old villages, building um, hydroelectric power plants, etc. So doing, I mean, what is more socialist in general than the hydroelectric power plant? I mean, where is the programmer with a little bit of fantasy and invention? Where is the hydroelectric power plant program? I want to see that. Because not only would we then have really quite a lot of films from, the, um, from Central and Eastern Europe, but also from places like the United States, where actually in the more socialist moment in the 30s, also building this kind of stuff was very much part and parcel of the, let's say, the new way of trying to make politics. So, Poem of the Sea is, for all its melancholia, also a pain to the Soviet state, to the necessities of sacrifice. Farewell, as now interpreted by her husband, became essentially an allegory of the unfathomable destructiveness of all, let's say, um, ideas of progress. It's a deeply, deeply, deeply melancholic film. Not surprising, as it's based on a, on a Rasputin narrative. So, I mean, he was not a joker. So, but it's really interesting that she wanted to return at that point, late 70s, early 80s, to this motif. Because, yes, this was one of the big Soviet motifs, one of the big socialist motifs. This film essentially is really about the pains of a whole idea collapsing, coming to an end. If you are looking for first traces of socialist countries understanding that they are in a process of transformation that will see to its annihilation, that's one of the films. 89 is already there. And that's all that's, that's, that there is to say. So I hope this was not too horribly boring. And um, I hope you do not regret having come. And it's that, I mean, I guess now it's time for lunch. So happy lunch. Thank you. No questions. <laughs>
I would say so. Uh, Certainly the movie, maybe not the lunch. just wanted to say, I mean, if you have some questions in the next few days or when, I mean, I'm around till the 20th and I guess I'm difficult to miss. I'm this big hunk standing around somewhere looking stupid. So basically, if you want to ask something about this or the program for which I'm here for real, which is the old people's program, the tiger burns, just just approach me. It's, it's okay. I don't bite normally. <laughs>